You're listening to Life, the Universe, and Everything Else. Today on the show, last year's news. <laughs> Life, the universe, and everything else explores the intersection of science and society. Original music is produced by Ian James, and this episode was edited by Marissa McCool. Find her on Patreon at patreon.com slash QAF. Wow, excellent. That's one way to title it. My name is Jim Newman, and with me today I have Lauren Bailey. Hi. Laura Creek Newman. Hi there. And Ashlyn Noble. Hello, Happy New Year. Happy New Year! <laughs> today we're going to talk about 2022. It no longer being 2022. We're going to just each take sort of a broad topic and discuss how that thing went in 2022. The year can no longer hurt us, so we can taunt it again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so... We are going to start off with my segment. I'm going to talk about last year in tech. Yay! Woohoo! That just seems like so much work to have decided to do in the last couple of days. I just, I'm just, <laughs> that's so much information. Yeah. So I'm just going to do some quick hits and then I'm going to pick one thing to talk about in detail. Okay. Ah, okay. I'm definitely going to miss some of the big stories, but here are the tech stories that I have been following this last year. And we're going to start off with the one that probably everybody is, is thinking of. We'll just get it out of the way. Elon Musk and Twitter. I'll be honest, I didn't even bother to write this part of the segment because we've all been following it. So I just wanted to ask the panel, any favorite moments in the Musk Twitter saga? Technically, it happened this year, but they're getting sued. Twitter is getting sued for not paying the rent on their San Francisco head office <laughs> as nice. it is because I, musk decided not to pay the rent uh-huh i so everybody I, I, must come to the office but nobody but they won't pay the rent for them there was also that story that came out i think last week that the janitorial staff the custodial staff was unionizing and musk had basically told them no and mm. so everybody in twitter hq was like hoarding toilet paper and none of the bathrooms were being cleaned and it was yep Sounding pretty nightmarish. The accountants all quit, so their taxes this next year are going to be fun. Yeah. I like the probably, d definitely, I think the funniest part. Okay, no, no, no. The funniest part is how miserable Elon is all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's that, great. I love it. <laughs> yeah. You can visit the website elonspersonalhell.com and it just redirects to Twitter. Oh, nice. <laughs> he lost. He lost over a billion dollars in what? Well, more than he lost several billion dollars this past year in his personal wealth. Amazing. I think for me, one of the funniest parts is all of the articles that say things that are variations on. We tried to contact their PR department about the fact that they have no human rights department anymore, but they don't have one of those anymore either. So, eh, we tried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every right. article must end with the disclaimer. You said human rights department. I assume you meant human resources department. No, they have. They had a whole department that was like designed to not let people get human trafficked and shit. And they don't have that oh anymore. My God. Yeah. Oh wow. I, okay. I did not misspeak. No, I, I I heard HR and thought that you had misspoken. Good lord. <laughs> okay, okay. So whenever you know how there's always strange rules and you're like, mm, what happened to make this rule? You gotta, like, <laughs> why do they have this rule, right? Why do they yeah. have this? My, I do not support human trafficking t-shirt is precipitating a lot of questions answered by my t-shirt. However, <laughs> however that <laughs> phrase goes. I think probably like the, maybe the most fun I've had on Twitter in the last several years ever was during the first rollout of the paid verification system where everybody was oh. it was pretty delicious 
and all of the hilarious impersonations and then the new second tier of verification system they had to like quickly implement because advertisers were leaving in droves extremely funny the telling all of the employees they had to sign on to be extremely hardcore for long hours or like quit and so and many then being quit. shocked that most of them quit. Yeah. Like, what were you thinking, yeah. my dude? Because he Doesn't like understand humans. Yeah, I mean, like like most tech billionaires, he doesn't know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. He's just the pitch man. And like most apartheid billionaire scions, he's used to slave labor. <laughs> So one of the sadder codas to that is, of course, that a lot of people couldn't leave because they're on work visas. And right. if they left, they would probably suffer deportation. So that's not great. The, Again, the look repeated, for the lack of human rights department. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> most recently, I think one of the most recent things I saw, all of the links to Mastodon had stopped working. And then they finally, several days later, officially banned advertising for competing platforms <laughs> on Twitter, which is funny. And then it's, they immediately uh, had to yeah. reverse their policy on outside links because it was so absurd and also violated the big UK privacy thing. Uh-huh. Anyway, it will be, I think, amusing to follow the news, but I, it's definitely not as fun to be on Twitter, go down with the ship anymore. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see how that all shakes out. Any other thing that we wanted to mention about Twitter before we move on? I haven't been yeah. on it in over six weeks now. Oh, I good for you. I haven't logged in. I think I've finally broken my Twitter addiction. I've replaced it with reading trashy Reddit subs. <laughs> so that's not much better. So now I'm working on not doing that. I think not having Twitter on my phone has been better for my mental health. Good for you. And it, it doesn't all have to be cold turkey, Lauren. You can take a gradual approach. That's fine. I did, but it didn't work. So for me, it does have to be cold turkey. Well, I meant like you, you trade one for a slightly less bad thing, and then you keep doing that until you're where you want to be. I think I went from fentanyl to heroin, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> there are some good competing platforms. Cohost.org is a great one for folks who aren't interested in Mastodon, but who knows how this will all shake out. It'll Maybe be interesting I will be able, I'll be able to get off of social media entirely. Mm -hmm. But Laura is right. A gradual step down usually works for people who are not me. I would like to once again shout it out into the universe that if I could see updates from my friends a la Twitter or Facebook on Discord, I would abandon everything else immediately. Yep. <laughs> so why don't we move on from social media and talk about mergers. 2022 saw further consolidation in the tech sector, most notably in the games industry. So last January, Microsoft announced that it would acquire Activision Blizzard for $68.7 billion. Activision Blizzard is, of course, best known for the Diablo, StarCraft, Warcraft, Hearthstone, and Overwatch franchises, and whatever it is that Activision makes. They are also known for sexual harassment, and worse. The company yep. was subject to a lawsuit from the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing in 2021, which alleged a frat boy atmosphere that encouraged sexual misconduct and hiring discrimination. Shortly after Microsoft announced its acquisition of Activision Blizzard, Sony announced that it would be buying Bungie, best known as the original makers of Halo, Microsoft's flagship franchise, and Destiny for $3.6 billion. Last month, the United States Federal Trade Commission announced that they would attempt to block Microsoft's purchase of Activision Blizzard, citing concerns that the purchase would be anti-competitive. According to Holly Vadova, director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition, quote, Microsoft has already shown that it can and will withhold content from its gaming rivals. Today, we seek to stop Microsoft from gaining control over a leading independent game studio and using it to harm competition in multiple dynamic and fast-growing gaming markets. 2022 also saw the merger of Warner Media, owner of HBO, with Discovery Incorporated. This merger resulted in a bunch of cancellations, most notably the Batgirl feature film, which was in post-production at the time. This would segue nicely into the collapse of the streaming market, but I didn't bother to write a whole lot on that. Folks have probably been following this, but just in brief, 2022 has seen Netflix hemorrhaging subscribers, potentially accelerated by the price hikes that they have used to shore up their lost revenue. 
Subscriber numbers from the end of the year showed some signs of recovery at Netflix, perhaps contributed to by HBO Max's struggles under the discovery. But with the splintering of the streaming Wait, market, nothing. I is. didn't understand that last part. Oh, so sorry. So subscriber numbers for Netflix from the end of 2022 did show some signs of recovery. And this may be due in part to the fact that competing platforms have also been struggling. So, for example, HBO Max had a massive overhaul with the Discovery merger, and that resulted in loss of subscriptions to HBO Max. So people are also mad at HBO Max, so they might be going back to Netflix. Yeah, that's that's okay. a possibility. But the whole streaming ecosystem is splintering in so many different directions. It's really hard to say what's going on and what the future will hold. I mean, that was pretty clear just with the number of services that popped up and then the siloing, like at least from Netflix point of view, the thing that one of the things that people liked about Netflix is that you could get a variety of different things in one place. But then each production company took their things off. First, it started with Disney, and then it went to Paramount and so on and so forth. And so people just said, well, I'm not paying cable prices anymore because that's what you would have to do to have all these subscriptions and then go back and forth between them. And so but then when you splinter it again, if one doesn't make enough good stuff or has bad management like HBO Max, then people are like, OK, well, I'm going to go back to whatever it was. Yeah, that's so what, well before Disney too. Yes. Yeah. We, we, we bought. <laughs> as well. sure. yeah. I, I and I will say I'm not the most up on it, but when Disney left, at least for me and my parent friends, like that became a are you going to get a deal. new subscription or not? Right. Yeah. That was a big deal for for those of us with small children who like Disney films. Yeah, we are. Well, I'm proud to say that we are one of the families that cut the cord on Netflix this year. The transphobia and the upping the prices, it's not worth my money. When I first started subscribing to Netflix, it was $8.99 Canadian a month. And now it's going up to, I think, 23 or 25 per month. And I got better things to do with that money. I'm subscribing to a, to two Patreons instead for that same money. Yeah, and Agreed. as predicted by many memes beforehand, we were just going back to pirating things. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's just easier now that there are eight different places that we have to subscribe to. <laughs> we spent the money on a UPS and a, and a media server, and we use Plex. There you go. Speaking of streaming, try to contain your amazement, everyone, but Google has killed yet another project. Yay! Which one? So some folks might be aware that Google a few years ago had announced a streaming game console called Stadia. Not really a console, kind of a console, but basically what you could do is you could run a video game on Google servers and then stream it over the internet to your home with very little lag time, assuming you had fiber optic internet connection. And it was an interesting experiment, as many of Google's experiments are. It was odd that they were trying to convince you to buy a 60 to 80 dollar game for the stadia which meant that you didn't actually have the game but just had the ability to stream it like mm. i think a lot of people assumed that it would be a subscription model like netflix and it was not so they announced that they're shuttering the project 2022, I believe they shut down the store right after the announcement, but you could still play your games until 2023, which, of course, shows Is now <laughs> yeah, that, that you should never trust <laughs> a tech company to keep your stuff mm. and give you access to it. And there's uh, no recourse for these people who paid money for games that they will now no longer be able to play. So the interesting thing is that in this case, Google stated that they would issue a full refund for everybody who purchased anything through Stadia. Wow. It, oh, yeah, really? it is. It is surprising. Yeah. So uh, this is another in a long line of Google projects that seemed cool technologically, had a lot of backing from certain sort of champions internally, and then the giant enterprise that is Google just sort of shifted itself slowly in a different direction and the support evaporated and they decided to just cut and run. So yeah. this has happened. People, I don't think anybody remembers Google Wave. Is that what it was called? A project that was announced in like the 
the mid 2000s seemed a, like a cool collaboration tool. A lot of its stuff got folded into Google Docs. There was Oh yeah, you were supposed to be able to kind of it was like all being in the Google Doc together, but you were supposed to be more interactive and fun than that. Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of like a precursor to what like Teams tries to do now. Yeah. Uh, from Microsoft. There was oh, everybody remembers Google Reader, which got I'm still killed, bitter about it. Killed because it was competing with their core business of <laughs> ad revenue. There's Google Glass, which thankfully is gone. God. There, the, the projects are many, but Google has retired yet another one. Speaking of large tech companies and projects that maybe should be retired, we have Facebook and the metaverse. So oh I'll quote from the New York Times from October. Meta said on Wednesday that its profit in the most recent quarter was down more than 50% from a year ago. So they have released several sets of earnings over the last year that shows that they are massively losing money. The end of 2021 numbers, which were released in 2022, showed that the first time that Facebook has seen its daily active users decline since the history of the company. Is that because so many of them died of COVID? <laughs> was a good joke. Whatever. <laughs> Yeah, they've they've wiped billions of dollars off of their valuation. They posted a ten billion dollar loss from the Ooh. metaverse business. But they finally gave them legs. Yeah, How can they have that much loss when they now have legs? So exciting! That's yeah, so much. Oh my goodness! Let's just keep throwing that money down down the pit, right? Did you hear about the startup that is selling a technology to make its call center workers sound like white Americans? Oh, no. Oh, my God. Oh, no. I will quote from a Vice News article. Continuing Silicon Valley's long and storied history of misreading dystopian satires as instruction manuals, <laughs> a startup has created a tech product that makes call center workers' voices sound white. Ironically, given its focus on empowerment, Sanas's software to turn call center workers' voices into white American voices mirrors the plot of Boots Riley's 2018 dystopian satire, Sorry to Bother You. In the film, the ability to put on a white voice on the phone allows the film's black protagonist to rise up in the company, but introduces tension in the workplace that undercuts a union drive and eventually pits him against his former co-workers. So according to Vice, the software allows tech workers to, it's called accent translation software that Sanas is selling. It allows their workers to, with the click of a button, turn their voices from an Indian accent, for example, into an American accent or an English accent or what have you. This, well... I don't know how much we need to comment on this. This is obviously pretty grim. The company pitches this as a way for call center employees to suffer less abuse because they're frequently the targets of racism. Seems like a band-aid fix for a systemic problem to me, and one that will probably be used and exploited by the owners of the call centers. Yeah, sounds gross to me. I'm just going to... I'm not as eloquent as you to me it's just gross mm -hmm. but like from working in a call center i remember th the way that people with different accents would get treated sure. so much worse than me it was absolutely yeah yeah oh i believe it I'm i just... get the reasoning behind this company is trying to sell it as but it's still no this is not the way yeah yeah it will not be used for any good that may have gone into its creation yeah there you go why don't we talk a little bit about EU regulatory changes? So we touched on them a little bit earlier, but they regulatory changes came in this year that will force most technological gadgets to use a standard USB-C connector, which includes Apple. So beginning with the iPhone 15 slated for release this year, Apple is expected to move all of their phone connectors over to the standard USB-C connector. The standard, it's worth noting, that they were among the first to champion when they released MacBooks without USB-A connectors. God. So chickens are coming home to roost or whatever. Mm -hmm. And now two more quick hits. Venture capital is also struggling. Oh, darn. I'm sad. We're all, let's all take a moment of silence. So 
FTX is bankrupt. Sam Bankman Fried is in prison. I find the ongoing collapse of the crypto industry extremely cathartic. But for reasons that will go unexplained, I'm going to have to ask someone else from the panel to read a few paragraphs from this article from Fortune and Bloomberg News. <laughs> if somebody wouldn't mind. Okay. I would just like to say that I was horrified this Christmas when my father seemed to be seriously talking about now getting into crypto. Like, dad, oh. no. No. You gotta buy what are you up. thinking? <laughs> it's got nowhere to go but up, Ashlyn. Right? I just no, Dad. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, Lauren. Oh, I see why my gem asked somebody else to read this. <laughs> Venture firm Tribe Capital wrote to a select group of its co-investors earlier this month with some bad news. Tribe was slashing its internal valuation of Canadian British startup Invinia, on which it had bet. $30 million by 95%. Invinia co-founder and chief executive officer Matthew Hudson had been terminated and a board-led investigation found that he had secretly, systemically, and repeatedly inflated the revenue and profitability of the company. According to the memo, which was sent by Invinia board member and tribe CEO Arjun Sethi. Bloomberg News reviewed a copy of the memo, the contents and details of which, along with Hudson's termination, haven't been previously reported. Just two years ago, Tribe had enthusiastically pitched Invinia, which used machine learning to manage electrical grids, to potential co-investors. According to Sethi, Hudson no longer had anything to do with the company. A UK filing shows he was terminated as a director of the company as of October 28, listing no reason for the change. In addition to resolving specific problems at Invinia, Tribe is grappling with a portfolio that also includes FTX and crypto exchange Kraken, which recently settled allegations that it violated US sanctions against Iran. Several others of its investments have been caught up in an industry-wide decline in valuations, according to Tribe's latest assessments. We are then talking about companies that members of our panel could plausibly have worked at at some time in the past. I'm happy to take back the reins of this segment. You are welcome to them, and I will turn off my newscaster voice. <laughs> uh, secretly, systemically, and repeatedly inflated the revenue and profitability of the company. Hot damn, what a sentence. Pretty darn good. Yeah. I will refrain from commenting. But believe it or not, what I really want to talk about is some good news. So let's talk unions. Woo! 2022 was a landmark year for unions in the tech sector. The Amazon Labor Union was established April 1st, 2022, with the successful organization of workers at Staten Island's JFK 8 Amazon Warehouse. The New York Times described the outcome as one of the biggest victories for organized labor in a generation. Amazon, as a company, continues to fight unionization drives at other workplaces. It's been exciting to watch. Yeah, we see this happening outside of the tech sector as well. There's a lot of Starbucks unionization going on. and. Yeah, people are starting to recognize that they, as workers, deserve power in the workplace. Mm -hmm. It's heartening to see, even with this year seeing a, a vote by my own siblings in my union that got us a deal that was not, we'll just say not good for the workers in my union. Mm -hmm. It can be a struggle. It's painful. Raven Software's quality assurance team voted to unionize in May, making it the first mm -hmm. union at a major U.S. video game studio. Raven Software is one of the studios behind Call of Duty Warzone and is a wholly owned subsidiary of Activision Blizzard. The, <laughs> well, <laughs> Blizzard was bought by Activision, which is now being bought by Microsoft, right? Yep. So the union was initially formed in January, and the QA team asked their parent company to voluntarily recognize it, which of course Activision Blizzard declined. They forced a vote. Activision Blizzard's response to the vote was telling. Quote, We respect and believe in the right of all employees to decide whether or not to support or vote for a union. We believe that an important decision that will impact the entire Raven Software Studio of roughly 350 people should not be made by 19 Raven employees. The 19 employees referenced here were the 19 out of 22 members of the Raven Software QA team that voted to unionize. So the entire team would be unionized. Good for, for those. Them. Yeah, for those unfamiliar with anti-union talking points, this might seem like a reasonable response from Activision Blizzard. 
The company then attempted to block the unionization efforts on these grounds by forcing a new vote that included essentially the entire company, not just the QA team. Well, I think it's important that all workers be organized. Companies will often intentionally pit workers uh, against each other. Different teams have different needs and different teams are starting in different places in terms of working conditions, benefits, pay, etc. QA workers rank among the lowest paid workers in the games industry and are frequently classified as contract workers rather than employees, increasing their precarity. By attempting to force a company-wide vote, Activision Blizzard was counting on its less precarious employees to keep the QA workers in line. Thankfully, the National Labor Relations Board rejected Activision Blizzard's challenge of the vote, and in June, Activision Blizzard CEO announced that the company would recognize the union and begin negotiations. In the meantime, new initiatives that would benefit QA workers at Activision Blizzard were announced, but Raven's QA team was excluded from these initiatives. What? Cur curious. We've seen similar tactics with Starbucks over the last few years when wage increases and additional benefits were offered to workers at all stores except those who had voted to unionize in a transparent attempt to create buyer's remorse and pit workers against each other. I would encourage all workers, of course, to recognize that these wage increases and benefits that are being afforded to non-union workers are hardly an argument against unionization. Despite affecting only non-union workers, they happened as a result of unionization. Because Howard Schultz is a scared little man. <laughs> yep. Let's continue to make him scared. In June, Microsoft, Activision Blizzard's prospective buyer, announced that it had reached an agreement with the Communication Workers of America, pledging that it would remain neutral if any of Activision Blizzard's employees unionized. The antitrust scrutiny Microsoft is currently facing, of course, may incentivize it to play nice with labor for the time being, until the FTC allows it to further solidify its monopoly. But in the meantime, workers are pressing their advantage. Just last month, a group of 300 QA testers at ZeniMax, a company that Microsoft purchased in 2021, also announced the formation of a union. Official vote tallies are not yet in as of this recording. A little closer to home, the QA team for Keyword Studios in Edmonton, which is contracted out to support development at BioWare, voted in June to form a union. Keyword Studios, which is based in Ireland, announced that they would recognize the union and begin negotiations. To paraphrase a meme that Ashlyn shared with me yesterday, workers in the games industry are finally learning that, in video games as in life, the final enemy that you will face, and the one that you must defeat at any cost, is the boss. <laughs> Such a good meme. <laughs> so that is last year in tech. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. Select highlights of. Yes, yeah, select highlights of. You can't just throw all of the code up on the screen and see what happens. So You can, however, if you work for Elon Musk, print it out and have him evaluate your suitability as a developer. It's uh, the length of document. Yeah. Primarily. Oh, my God. <laughs> Absurd. <laughs> How many lines of code have you written this year? I don't know. I've been working on this same goddamn problem for six months. You're fired. What? A little too close to life for some people. <laughs> Did we want to make any predictions about the next year in tech? Yeah. I do think we're eventually going to see the plug pulled on Twitter. There's going to be one too many fail whales. Hmm. See, I'm not sure. Part of me thinks maybe it'll just keep struggling along and just become like another far right cesspool. Yeah. My prediction, I'm not going to make a prediction on Twitter one way or the other, but I will predict that within the next year, we will see a non-QA team unionize in the video games industry. Dev team or something like that. That would be nice. We okay. have, there have been, and I'm speaking in North America, there have been, like there are existing unions in Europe, with Europe having a much better labor climate in large part. And there, there have been a few unions at very small companies, but I think we'll see hopefully a AAA or double A studio with a dev union. That would be nice to see. It would be nice. I don't know. Flying cars. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> Jetpacks, etc. 
Do you remember make... Where's My Jetpack? <laughs> yes. Where's My Jetpack? Such a great segment, Jim. <laughs> Your Andy Rooney moment. <laughs> I predict that someone, like some startup somewhere, will once again try and reinvent public transportation. <laughs> Every year. A prediction yeah, I like to proof, play the proof. safe bet. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, I love when those they, are so funny. I love them. I love when they reinvent libraries. What did mm -hmm. you say your favorite one was before Ashland when they reinvent taxes? Yeah, it's every time they, they reinvent, like, what if we just pooled our money and then bought things that's useful to everyone? <laughs> <sighs> wow, yeah. you guys are so original. <laughs> yeah. And then the other one I saw recently that really made me laugh was a self-driving car problem will be solved by specific lanes for self-driving cars and then the reply was my brother in tech you have reinvented trains again <laughs> <laughs> yeah the my brother in tech it's just yeah that just cracks mm -hmm. me up <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> well done Okay, so why don't we move on to Ashlyn's segment. What have you got for us last year, Ashlyn? Oh, good. I want to talk about 2022 in snacks because I wanted to make a lighthearted segment. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And this was the only thing that I could come up with that I could also research in a morning. So 2022 in snacks. I began my research as any good podcaster does by googling my topic directly 2022 snacks number one result the bon appetit website which promised to tell me what the 10 most popular snacks are from bon appetit in 2022 and i was like awesome i love fancy people food <laughs> i love weird the, the weird combinations that they put together i love the beautiful pictures that they have and the fact that i saw a recipe on there the other day that was like you for sure have all of these things in your pantry. And one of the things was tahini. And I was like, what? Who are you? <laughs> I used to have tahini in the in the fridge all the time. And then I stopped. Well, yeah, hummus. but because we didn't use it for like a year. That's why it was in the fridge for that long. <laughs> <laughs> it was still good. Anyway, <laughs> Bon Appetit is for fancy people is what I'm saying. Screw the rules. I have money. And apparently what fancy people wanted to eat in 2022 was tomatoes and cheese. Ah, yes. Okay, so of the top 10 snacks, here are the things that mostly, like, were primarily tomatoes and or cheese. Tomatoes and feta. Yep. That's that's the recipe. That was, that was <laughs> early, that was, like, January, February, March of 2022. Sure, sure. Well, you know this better than me. What are you talking the about? The whipped feta this? trend. Oh, this was, like, all over the place. Oh, the tomato, no, tomatoes and feta, this was a specific recipe. Oh, for okay. like a tomatoes and feta dish that they said was their one of their most popular recipes in 2022. Oh, is this but the, yeah, one where the you pasta just, like... that had the tomatoes and feta? I remember what you were saying, what that was too. Okay, okay, sorry, go on. So this no specific tomatoes and feta. Yeah. Was there any basil uh, in it or just tomatoes and feta straight up? Probably. I'm exaggerating. <laughs> the next one, curry tomato sandwich. He's hot! He's spicy! He tastes Blistered cherry tomato toast, mango salsa, which definitely had tomatoes in there, mozzarella sticks with tomato sauce, so cheese and tomatoes going on there, mm. chipotle cheddar crackers, chachapas, which is apparently a Venezuelan cheese and corn pancake. Sounds pretty good. Primarily that cheese. That does sound good. And then a fried eggplant with whipped feta. Also, like all of these things, fine, sure, but that's... Eight out of ten recipes are primarily cheese or tomato. <laughs> <laughs> Both so I looked for something on this list I wanted to actually eat, and I failed. <laughs> <laughs> well, both tomatoes and cheese we can produce here at Oosthaven, so we can get in this on this trend. We can make fancy people food. Yes, <laughs> we can sell fancy people our food. So apparently 2022 in fancy people snacks, tomato and cheese. That's last year's news on that. I went to look for something a little more relatable. I found a Cosmo article, which normally I do not find Cosmo articles relatable, let me tell you. <laughs> However, the Cosmo Snack Awards I find very relatable. 
These apparently started in 2021 and f- was more of a all-time snack awards. This year, they focused on portable snacks, which is a very important snack feature. Okay. I was drawn into this list by the fact that several snacks I already love are mentioned, so I have to assume that these people have better taste than the Bon Appetit folks. <laughs> and I would just like to mention a few standout awards that, in my opinion, are correct. Moon Cheese, one of my new favorites this year. I've been taking it hiking. It's just like portable, extremely light protein, crunchy, kind of greasy. It's freeze-dried delicious. cheese, right? Yeah, it's just cheese that has had all of the moisture sucked out of it. Yep. They made and cheese it's crunchy. Delicious. They specifically <laughs> recommend the gouda and pepper gu- pepper gouda, which Sounds they say like tastes like. like portable cacio e pepe. <laughs> <laughs> I personally have enjoyed the the plain cheddar ones and the pepper jack. Mm. Very tasty. Uh, Good. That's a surprising for Ashlyn. Pepper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it has a little bit of a for me. <laughs> Spiciness? Yeah. No one else will notice this, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> they also mention Dots pretzels, which are incredible and sadly unavailable here. But you folks in the United States, specifically the Midwest, I think mostly is where they're concentrated. They're so good. Mm, delicious what pretzels, makes them, I found. What makes them good? They have a really good, I don't know, texture. But then they also have like a seasoning salt sort of flavor to them but it's not ridiculously overwhelming okay yeah so it's just both like a good flavor good crunch when i was like i really like these pretzels maybe i'll try rolled gold and so i tried some of those after running out of the delicious pretzels it was like oh these are dry as hell and so bad compared to (laughs) (laughs) i don't know how you make a pretzel more moist than average but yeah ask bavaria what oh well it's a whole different animal. Those are the kind of pretzels that I like. <laughs> Same here. Big surprise, Jim. <laughs> I like those little bites that you can get when they're they're not a gigantic one you have to gnaw pieces off of. Mm, but if I don't have bites. a giant piece of bread, what like to gnaw on? <laughs> like, what's <laughs> the point otherwise? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now I understand. <laughs> We're coming at this from different perspectives. <laughs> <laughs> Why is the bread crunchy? Just make it soft <laughs> and salt it and oil it. Mm. Another thing that they had put on their list that I agree with is those little snack plates that have the the bread and the cheese and the salami and it's like an adult lunchable. I love those things. Highly recommend. There are many variations on these, many of which don't contain meat. So for the vegetarians that outnumber me <laughs> on this panel. Many a dinner in 2022 here at our home has been grown up lunchables. <laughs> yep, it's just cheese and crackers and Maybe meat and maybe some cucumbers. It was like the majority of my lunches when I was a kid. It was like cheese and crackers, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was reading a very boring article about like business trends in snacks 2022 or something. And they had mentioned that basically people want to eat protein as a snack. Yes, that is correct. So I'm glad that that trend has increased and also kind of crossed the border because it's always been pretty easy to find stuff like those snack packs in the states when we went there but not as much here Mm -hmm. one thing that they put on the list that i i'm gonna controversially disagree with is dunkaroos oh yeah they've been back in a big way lately yeah so like they came back and when i saw them i was so excited but then i tried them and they don't taste anything like i remember well, so to be honest, like I ate a bunch of Dunkaroos, but they were never great. They were just like cheap icing and cookies. But I loved that cheap icing, Laura. And I so I, like, I still have a sweet tooth. You understand the same. I, as I'm aware. Ashlyn. <laughs> I did not like this icing, Laura. So what's different about it? I guess. I don't know. It tastes maybe I've just grown up too much, but it tastes maybe. plasticky. <laughs> So, Ashlyn, that's what it always tasted like. You make better I, icing now. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's just what the kid, like, like I said, maybe Ashlyn, I've just grown up, but I feel like it was better before. You can't go home again. You can, yeah, yeah. you can't. No, with all those products, you should just look at them fondly on the shelf and walk on by. All right. Dunkaroos. Well, that's what I advise for Dunkaroos at this point. Don't Dunkaroos eat them. are the 
Dunkaroos are the snack version of Crocodile Dundee. Went from Australia to America and went so much worse. Hmm. Not that they were ever actually Australian. Yeah, it was like, yeah, wait, did they actually? No. <laughs> I, I'm I just making was... up confusing facts. Ah. <laughs> I'm on the name so I could make a Crocodile Dundee reference, which is completely relatable in 2023. No. Gotcha. <laughs> okay, last one I want to mention from the Cosmo Snack Awards was the most confusing entry for me. Best concert snack. I would like everybody here to nominate a good concert snack. Just whatever you can think of as the best concert snack. Cannabis joint. <laughs> <laughs> Not a snack, Lauren. <laughs> cannabis edible. Yeah. Closer, okay. but you, you... No, okay. I'll accept um, cannabis edible. Beer. Yeah, I'm... I'm not a concert person, but I'm also, like, I'm trying to... Like, the only snack that I've ever seen at a concert is, like, popcorn, but that's because we mm. go to the Burton Cummings Theater for concerts. Peanuts? <laughs> <laughs> Sure, that's that's a reasonable answer. Jem is old timey. I'm imagining him saying like in shell peanuts. Yeah, too. like yeah, like, like a concert at the what? X. You could bring in shell peanuts. Why not? Okay. Yeah. Well, so as you say that, Ashlyn, I'm thinking. Well, what kind of concert? Because immediately, what came to mind is no snack because you're making noise during theatrical performances. You jerk. I, I think um, they mean like a loud rock okay. concert. Then like oh. popcorn because it's meant. Like popcorn is, you expect it to spill, you expect it to be kind of messy, and that's what like rock concerts are. Okay. So that's okay. fine. Laura, it's it'll cheap. Be, right. It'll be okay. you and me at the symphony with our little sippy cups of $20 wine. Yep. You know yeah. it. Yeah. Glaring at those stupid people who choose some kind of crunchy thing. Yeah. Why are you chewing this? <laughs> there is an aria. <laughs> well, you would really hate this snack suggestion at the, the opera then. So again, this was the the only nominee, and as far as I can tell, winner of best concert snack. So there wasn't like a whole list of options. It was just best concert snack. Every word gets weirder. Boston cream donut flavored Pop Tarts. Oh <laughs> What? Oh. <laughs> Because <laughs> Laura screamed so loud and her mic cut off. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, to be fair, I even backed up when I knew that sound was going to come yeah. out. If you had stopped at Boston cream flavored, I would have been with you no matter. You know. uh, what? Like what? what? A what? Pop-Tart? A fucking what? Pop-Tart? That's not. <laughs> like, who right, this is an opera snack? No, a concert No, no. Like... Oh, I swear, I swear yeah, Ashlyn said an opera. opera snack. You said opera. Oh, okay. Whatever. L yeah, okay. Lauren said we'll be. <clears throat> no, 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 no. Lauren said symphony, and okay. Ashlyn said opera. Whatever. Okay, I'm sorry. Anyway, whatever. But a pop tart. Yeah, this was just a you know concert in general. Pop tart. Pop tart. It's not pop tarts. Why? Why? What is the rationale for this? The rationale was this will give you the sugar hit you need to get through the night. No, that's not no. how sugar works. Also, well, they said. <laughs> I wasn't even going to mention the rationale because it didn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> That's, that must have been a sponsored thing. They, like Kellogg's must have been like, we're not selling enough of these Boston cream pop tarts. Get it in some articles somewhere. I don't know. Oh my God. Like I would try that. That actually sounds good, but not at a concert. I don't like Boston cream, so I would not. <laughs> I my like favorite pop, pop tart is the s'mores. Yep. That was the only pop tart that I really liked. All the fruit ones I was unenthused by. And then toaster yep. strudels came along, which just blew pop tarts well out of the water. Mm -hmm. Even frozen toaster strudels are great. <laughs> Harder to spread the icing, though. No, you just squeeze that crap right in your mouth. <laughs> oh, right. boy. That concludes the Cosmo portion of my segment. Yay! The next portion of my segment is TikTok Food Trends 2022. Oh, 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 oh boy. Uh -oh. I, I have a guess of one of, I, I'm, okay, go on. I mean, there are so many. There may even be ones that are completely ridiculous that I missed. So you, you please, Laura, after. But so cloud bread was a big thing in 2022, which surprises me right. because I thought it was a big thing like quite a while ago. Yeah, I mean, the low carb thing just won't die. Every once yeah. in a while, it takes another gasp of breath and <laughs> and then has a little bit of a resurgence. Somebody somewhere starts posting about it because of a sponsored ad or whatever. And then a few people do it and then it just 
tries to die, but somebody keeps pumping in that IV fluid. And well, yeah. it doesn't have go. the energy because it doesn't have any carbs, <laughs> so it can't sustain. <laughs> anyway, it looks good. I have never tried it, but it does look kind of good. I don't know. Apparently, that was the number one TikTok trend this year by like a lot, which shocked oh, me again because really? I feel like I haven't heard about it this year, and I heard about it a lot before, but apparently it was huge this year. Another one that sounds kind of okay is baked oats. Basically, like making oatmeal and then baking it with chocolate chips and stuff. That sounds pretty good. Again, like, is it just because the people on TikTok are now old enough to be making their own food and they've discovered things that were being done by people who were their age like five to ten years ago? Yeah, maybe. Because, like, like, baked oatmeal was <laughs> was a big thing in circles, like... Five-ish years ago, everything was See, baked oatmeal. I remember oatmeal. fridge oatmeal being a big thing for a bit there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's not as much died down baked oatmeal. A little, but, but baked oatmeal was definitely in there. I mean, I run in food circles, so it's, yeah, it was sure. very popular on dietitian things. But it's just like, yeah, I mean, what's the age of the average TikToker? Like 17? So, like, they're just learning how to make food, I guess? I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. But I think it's also like a lot of adults are also looking for like a very easy comfort food. Sure, sure. That they can I mean, make I, look fancy. Baked oatmeal is a neat, it's a different type of, like it's a, a different variation. I like oats. They're good for you. Sure, have at it. <laughs> when does it stop being baked oatmeal and when does it turn into a cookie? Burger mm -hmm. content? Yeah, <laughs> and fat content. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, so it, it's, it's actually just like a big brick of oatmeal. Kinda. Uh, yeah. Oatmeal bar maybe would be a. Accurate it's kind of it. yeah. It's closer to a bar kind of consistency. Okay. And again, I people have... have been making their own like granola bars forever. Mm -hmm. And I have a recipe from like the 1200s that would, and probably older, where you'd make these for lunch, after from the oats from the morning. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Just oat cakes, modern oat cakes. All right. Anyway. Another fun, fun Twitter, not Twitter, TikTok trend was the famous pink sauce controversy. Oh, oh yeah. I don't yeah. think I heard about this. What is this? Oh, okay. So a chef who was a personal chef that had her own TikTok channel posted mm -hmm. this pink sauce, which is made of, let me see if I can remember, dragon fruit, the red dragon fruit. Oil, chili, garlic, all of those things that go with that. And she says she's been using it f for her clients to like dress up potatoes and salads and grilled veggies. And she started selling it. Okay. And it became super popular and trendy. But people started wondering whether the stuff was actually safe. There were discrepancies between what it said was listed in the ingredients and like the handling instructions. Some bottles arrived bloated and rotten. It, God. it didn't have instructions to refrigerate it, but there may or may not have been milk in it. It was kind of a disaster. It. Yeah, well, it was uh, also she did not have, this was not like FDA approved in any way. Like <laughs> Okay, so it's just some person who took something that would be fine if you made small quantities and kept it at home and ate it fresh and just decided to bottle it in who knows what and sell it all over the country. Is that right. what happened? Right, and she said that oh, she... Oh, okay. Ugh. Hmm? It's it's fine. <laughs> yeah, she said that she had like gotten a company to help her out with this. It was all being made in a good facility, whatever. But people have questions about the veracity of that. <laughs> so yeah, gross. There are apparently still plans in the works to have it sold in stores, but it is still currently like quote unquote for sale on her website. But it is has been out of stock. Mm. So. Yeah, we'll see what happens with the pink sauce, or if it just is one of those curious things that we'll talk about in five years of trivia. Oh yeah, you remember that pink sauce? Yeah. <laughs> Weird trend that went viral: butterboards. Did you oh, all yeah. hear about this? Yeah, just Briefly. just putting butter on a board and swirling it around, and maybe putting some tasty things on it, and then dipping things in it. But yeah, but people, butter is not a dip. It's it's not. I'm cool. Emma with is the, looking like, artistic horrified idea right this, now. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say more puzzled. Well, you went from horrified to puzzled. Like you started thinking about it, and then you're like, "But wait, how?" 
but it yeah, like butter is good. We butter good, tasty, yeah. yes, yum. But just like a whole whack of it on a board. No, yep. no thanks. They're very pretty. Sure. But there's sure. lots of pretty things that aren't tasty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe a, a yeah. small one for like among friends if I have if I'm making fancy bread. I could see that. Yeah. yeah. Too many but people the, dipping into a board covered in butter, that seems bad. But also, like, butter, well, at least for me, I, I like butter on things, but I don't like it to the volume that you would do, like, a cheese or a dip or something on a piece of bread or cracker or something like that. Like, that's too much butter. And to get yeah. it off the, yeah, anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would be less of a dip and more of a smearing it across, like, you'd have to drag your bread product or whatever through it and i couldn't see like putting butter on potato chips i think that's where i draw the line Ew. yeah you've all mm. you've all determined exactly the problems that many people have with this trend <laughs> okay we are yeah. probably that did not stop it. people <laughs> because it looked pretty and it was good for tiktok yeah. slash instagram this segment is not about justifying these trends it's just telling no. you about them <laughs> <laughs> have you heard laura specifically about jelly drink no, I don't think so. This is very upsetting for even me to learn about, so I, I wish that I could see your faces right now. Okay. It's, it's apparently something that started when someone posted about making it for his girlfriend on Girlfriend Day, and then he explained that he takes a cup full of gummy candy and pours boiling water on it and lets it dissolve, and then puts it in the fridge to make it cold and then tops it up with some flavored milk and calls it jelly drink. Okay, gross, but let's back up to girlfriend day? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's a Japan thing, maybe? Okay. But yeah, that that's pretty you. And from there, this apparently went quite viral and many people were making jelly drink for themselves and their significant others. And then there was a whole trend of like, you don't have to have someone to make jelly drink for you. You can make it for yourself. <laughs> Which oh is my cute. gosh. And then there was I a mean, whole drink yeah. of people, up, you know, finding out about antacids because, oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry. You just, you top it with milk. Is that it? That, is that's that what it is? Okay. I mean... But yes, this... it's primarily dissolved gummy candy. I, yeah, okay, not not my kind of thing. I had not heard of this trend. There is a long history of like jellied stuff in a lot of Asian cultures, and so the idea of just taking some other gelatin based thing or agar based thing and just making do, doing quick jelly out of it basically <laughs> and mm. then topping it with milk like it it sounds kind of like some kind of a milk tea or something like that mm. that you might find so i don't know i mean like not not my thing at all but yeah okay sounds like something tiktok would be all over much less horrified than i expected laura to be yeah no it, it's yeah no, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's probably less sweet than the places where you can choose your sugar on bubble tea and you can get it like 200%. Gross. That's wild to me. Because it, I think 100% is too sweet. And if I think 100% is too sweet, there should not be a 200%. There is, there is no hope for anyone in that case. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, Ashlyn is part hummingbird, so when she's it's like, true. no, 50% 50, 50 sugar is good enough for this brown sugar tea. Yeah, yeah, I think I think having just the milk over it would probably dampen the sweetness a little That's bit. That's fair. That's fair. Maybe I should give this a try, and maybe I shouldn't be dunking on it before I've tried it. No, don't However, be. this next thing, I will not be trying. Healthy Coke. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad you haven't heard about this. What is this? <laughs> well, it's cocaine, okay. but it's healthy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that kind of Coke. Oh, okay. <laughs> healthy Coke. Healthy Coke is what you do when your Pilates instructor tells you that you should drink any kind of sparkling seltzer, like La Croix, etc. All any of yeah. that garbage. Okay. And then you just put a splash of balsamic vinegar in it. What? No. <laughs> what? No. She no. claims in the video that it tastes just like 
Coke and that this is something that her Pilates instructor told her to have instead of Coke. And the most of the virality of this recipe seems to be people trying it and then going, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> This, this I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I sure hope that it is mostly famous because people are like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> this does not taste like Coke. Well, but, so most people said that it actually doesn't taste bad. It's just nothing like Coke. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, when you get on like the diet culture train and that, there's so many mental gymnastics involved that. It's not hard to rationalize that kind of thing. For sure. Like, it's it's dark colored and bubbly. It, yeah. It's coke enough, like, in my mind right now because I have deprived myself to that extent. Exactly. But, yeah. Ugh. Like, like, you remember those sweet potato brownies that you, oh, that you tried yeah. to make a few years ago? Yes, I do. Sweet potato diet trend? The yeah. Sweet potato diet, yeah. Oh, none of those Fun. tasted right. But well, I could because... see where people squinting would go, oh, I guess. Exactly. Exactly. Sigh. <laughs> Just eat, people. Just eat what you want to eat. So, wait a minute. So, were they telling you to take unflavored seltzer? Or were you supposed to use a, f a specific flavored one that then the balsamic oh. mixed with that would make the Coke-like flavor? See, Laura, you have put more thought into this than the creator did, I think, because according to this TikTok video, you can just use any flavor. It's fine. <laughs> what? Okay. Like, that makes no sense. That makes no. zero sense. No, no, because I, I could imagine that certain flavors, like, I don't know, maybe the cherry one or something mixed with bal balsamic vinegar might give you a bit of that. Actually, I think that might taste more Dr. Pepper-like. But, like, that has some but plausibility like, to it. But it does. This but I'm doesn't. just, like, lime with that? I can't imagine that tasting like Coke. Yeah. You, you know what it would probably be like? If one of those magic pop machines that can dispense any flavor of pop together. Yep. If, if the sugar syrup ran out and it was just like that when you get a Slurpee in there, the mix is off. Mm, this is what yep. I'm picturing this tastes like. Hint of mm. Coke. Yeah. Yeah. A, yeah. a whiff of Dr. Pepper. Also, you know what's funny? Uh, I guess these things maybe don't exist in the U.S. because I can only imagine this is an American TikTok thing. But we have soda pop flavored sparkling waters here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. PC makes them. You can get root beer. You can get cola. You can get a variety of these things. So there's your healthy Coke. <laughs> right. I mean, and there are also no sure sugar versions of a lot of too. them. Yeah. yeah. Straight up. Yeah. It's, it's very silly. Okay. I would like to close out this segment by highlighting some excellent snacks that I made in 2022. Ooh. I had a pretty good year in food. I made a lot of food out of garden stuff that I grew. The, the radishes that I got to eat directly out of my garden, amazing snacks. The strawberries that my front yard made, amazing snacks. They were going until November. We were getting red yeah. berries until November. That's wild. Wow. Whoa. The neighbor kids were like, always checking <laughs> <laughs> i made cheese over a fire that was really cool that's the thing i did this year i would like to give a special mention to learning how to make toblerone fondue by mm. just melting a toblerone over the fire <laughs> <laughs> thanks to aaron for teaching us about that because that was a food highlight of my year for sure i made some extremely delicious nachos that i'm still thinking about with like a whole sheet pan worth of chips and just delicious toppings on top and fried corn. And I think I should make more nachos. Yeah, we should make those for dinner. Uh -huh. And I was also really happy this year that I feel like I have lasered in on my peanut butter and chocolate chip cookie recipes that I will be using forever. Like, Ooh, I think they're okay. perfect. And I'm not interested in searching the internet for any other versions. Nice. I am I am sitting here at my desk with they're they're in a, a covered container with a whole bunch of peanut butter and chocolate chip cookies that Ashwin has made and it has been torture for this whole recording sitting here with this pile of cookies and going I can't eat on mic I can't eat on mic <laughs> I can't eat something crumbly while I'm talking. Mm. 
Those so are, those little, do sound really good. Yeah. After after this recording, we will be eating these cookies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I also closed out the year by making my own fancy chocolates made out of like molds and they had fillings and I made Ooh. four four different fillings and put them together into a cute little box of chocolates for my New Year's party and I feel like I have leveled up. Nice. Ashlyn's a chocolatier. <laughs> yeah. We took a quality um, street box and changed the quality street to the name of our street and it was kind of cute. Aw, uh-huh. very cute. Ashlyn, I, I thought of one TikTok or social media food trend that you did not mention oh, that yes, I um, heard a lot about peripherally, which is the healthier watermelon. Did what? any of you hear about this? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, what's wrong with watermelon already? Well, because watermelon has too much sugar. So instead, oh, what you no. should do <laughs> is take cucumber and put Splenda on it. And it tastes just no. like watermelon. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Yeah, that, that was like a something thing. <laughs> sounds like something a five year old would make when they're do not like mom says no watermelon, have a cucumber. <laughs> I don't want to cut up a watermelon, have other food. Okay, yep. put some splenda on it or some sugar it, on it. Yeah, it, it it was a few weeks over the summer there. Because yes, we should all be worried about how much watermelon we're consuming, please. <laughs> oh, I liked your topic, Ashlyn. Thank you. Oh, Excellent. thank you. Take around, okay. So Lauren's going to go next. All right. So I'm a cheerful human being, as we all know. So I, yeah. my, my last year's yeah. news is who died? Woo? I was gonna, who died? Yeah. No, I, I said gonna, woo. Like, woo. Oh, like okay. as, a, as a questionable <laughs> cheer. <laughs> this is not an in, an, an intended oh segue into a who's on first bet. But. Yeah, Avon Costello. I can report they are both dead. Mm. I was going to do a whole segment about this past year and notable deaths, but going through the list and reading the news from the last little bit, I could do this past week in notable deaths and still have a full segment. <laughs> in 2022, we lost. No, wait. I don't want to say lost. Some of them will not be missed by the world at large, though I'm sure they have family that mourns them. But there were at least 40 current and former world leaders who died. We also saw the death of the world's oldest verified living person, which the title has obviously moved to somebody else. You crazy? He's dead! (laughs) Kane Tanaka died in April at the age of 119. She was Hmm. born in 1903. Some of the world leaders that I mentioned included the longest-running nepotism hire in history, Queen Elizabeth II of England. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, the first pope to abdicate since Gregory the Twelfth in 1485, Benedict the Sixteenth, and former 1990s Pizza Hut spokesman Mikhail Gorbachev. Oh yeah, he died. I forgot about that. I was going through this list and I'm like, Ray Liotta died. How did I not remember that? Yeah, it is very telling that when I did a Google search for approximate number of people who died in 2022 to get a ballpark, the first page hits. Were dominated by COVID data. Mm-hmm. Of yeah. The yearly world population data sheet states that COVID accounted for approximately 12% of 2022 deaths and greatly contributed to drops in life expectancy in a lot of countries. There were around 67.1 million deaths in total in 2022, so that 12% that were COVID responsible, that is approximately 8,052,000 deaths worldwide in 2022 for COVID. Hmm. And worldwide, per 100 people, Cuba has administered, this is a bit more happy news, Cuba has administered the most individual doses of COVID vaccines, with 90% of their population currently fully vaccinated, and 92% with some vaccination overall. Canada, I went and looked at our numbers, we have 90% overall, with 83% currently fully vaccinated. I do wonder how many of those convoy jerks are secretly fully jabbed. What's way, the definition of fully vaccinated? Yeah, that's a way bigger than yeah. I thought. It's two doses still, right? Three doses. Three doses. Okay. Mm. Yeah. I'm getting my numbers from a nonprofit run website. It's called ourworldindata.org, and it's run jointly by charities. The numbers looked fairly legit, and they've got numbers for basically everything you want to look at. 
if you're a numbers person, take a look at them. If we look at the breakdown of COVID vaccines by income level worldwide, we see our biggest discrepancy, of course. Of course. Higher income countries show 219 doses per 100 people. That's just over two doses per person. And lower income countries clocking in at 35 doses per 100 people. Ooh. Yeah. Check out our mm -hmm. last month's episode for Jem's review of how this is partially Bill Gates's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Back to my opening teaser. The final week of 2022 saw the deaths of In Order, world football star Pele, and fashion designer Vivian Westwood, both on December 29. Journalist and celebrity softball lobber slash reputation smoother, Barbara Walters on December 30th, <laughs> and the aforementioned Pope Benedict XVI on December 31. I did have a longer piece outlined about why Benedict should never have been Pope. Honestly, it doesn't really matter. If it hadn't have been him, it would have been somebody similar. Catholic Church, after the death of John Paul II, it was looking for someone to not rock the boat and to be an administrator while they got their shit back in order. And Benedict seemed to fit the bill. There were rumors, and I'm not sure if he confirmed them or not, that before the conclave started, he was going to actually retire from his cardinal seat. But then mm -hmm. uh, he got the white the call with the white smoke and went, oh, I guess that's me. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't until after he had become, become pope that the world really decided that it wasn't going to ignore the church covering up information about priests sexually assaulting children. And since he was part of that big cover-up, he did fall out, fall out of favor with other cardinals. So he was deemed perfect until they found out some stuff that he did. Funny that, huh? Well, or until they could no longer hide the stuff that he did. Yes, that is probably a better way to put it. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> As we know, the church knew. Oh, they always they knew. Yeah. They have... S they know. <laughs> Honestly... I think it was a good idea of his to abdicate. People were making the big things like, oh, not since 1485, blah, blah, blah. Good. Step down if you don't feel that you're, you're able to do the job. Officially, he stepped down, citing ailing health concerns, but he did last another eight years. Don't know how his brain was working, and I don't know how his body was working, but we had seen through history a lot of popes that were making very questionable choices towards the yeah. end of their, their papacies. They were, they, were, and, they were doing worse, but still in the job. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a correct idea to abdicate. Benedict was someone who should have been a monk who was made a king instead. And that never goes well. Mm -hmm. Just ask, yeah, just ask Louis VII of France. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that joke would have killed 840 years ago. Yeah, I'll, yeah sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Quite honestly, I'm in favor of lifetime appointees abdicating. It's a first step towards getting rid of lifetime appointments like heads of churches, heads of state, judges, politicians, and whoever else gets a guaranteed fancy life on the back of us normal people. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So there was a death of a lot of people in 2022, but not the death of Lauren's preachiness. <laughs> it will never die. It will never die. But speaking of death, well, I have been this whole segment. Who do you think's going to... What famous person do you think is going to meet their maker in 2023? Is it too pedantic to say I don't think anybody is going to meet their maker? Yeah, living? I was going to say. <laughs> I personally don't believe anyone will meet their maker, but I'm pretty sure Lauren and I are pulling the same lever here. We both are really, really hoping for Kissinger to he's finally... Gonna die, he's going to die one of these years. Yeah. <laughs> Although my... My date in the poll isn't till like 2026, but I don't want him to hold on that long just so I can win, win the... Win a few bucks, yeah. Yeah, well, it's not even a few bucks. It's just like, yes, this person won the poll. Yeah. <laughs> to enter the official poll, you have to donate to one of six charities that help people that Kissinger hurt. So I don- donated five bucks to East Timor Relief Fund and got my date in the poll. Mm-hmm. I would like to predict that Lucille Randon will die this year. Oh, the ne the current world holder of this <laughs> person. She is currently oh. 118 years, 325 days. She <laughs> just took the job in April, Ashlyn. <laughs> oh my. Like I said, I like the easy bets. <laughs> oh. 
Is this prediction in, in poor taste? Yes. I used to always go with Queen Elizabeth, but... That yeah. one, you got it, you got it. <laughs> yeah, should we say Chuck? <laughs> oh, no, he's got a few more years left in him, I think. He's got a few more. I don't... Comes I comes from a long-lived line. Know. He comes yeah. from a line of long-lived women, not long-lived mm. men. Well, his father was 96. Or 99? Oh, right. I forgot about that. He was that 99, time. wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, Philip, yeah, Philip got... But yes. I, I was thinking of the the other line. Like the, the queen and the, the queen mother? Yep. Both of whom. How old was the queen mother? She 102. was... 102. Yeah, they were both... Whew. I, I truly have no idea who's going to die this year. I can only hope it's Putin. I can only hope. But I don't know. I mean, the odds are not that bad. Like, Russian leaders who screw up in large public ways don't have good track records. We yeah, just need because of Putin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We need more of his generals or whatever to start turning on him. That's all. Hmm. But then the problem is, if they start doing that, like, Putin 2.0 will emerge from within their ranks, and it's just going right. to be a mess. I don't know, maybe Putin will trip and fall down the stairs or something like that. Like, I think it would be good if he's going to go. It, it should be hilarious. I think it should be a <laughs> hilarious way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Something embarrassing. Exactly. All right. On that cheery end of segment, <laughs> let's go into our something nice where we're less morbid. Hopefully. Who's going first? I can. Please. Do it. I Go never it. go first. This actually kind of ties into the idea of the year in review. So I'm going to call 2022 my year of sled runs because I have a tradition over the last few years of building a sled run for the kids in the backyard. And I think every year they're getting bigger and better. And last year's sled run was quite a good one, I think. Nice and dangerous, the way I like it. <laughs> and so, and we had a long winter last year. So that sled run, though I did start building it in December, it was, it reached its ultimate height and lasted for almost the first half of 2022. And oh. then I have now built my, this year's, this winter's sled run, which started in 2022. And I have been getting it really good. I'm icing it down really nicely. So it's very dangerous and the kids love it. Going to try to get one of them to fly over the fence. We'll see if we can. Well, the in. goal is I want them to be able to shoot out of the yard into the back lane and we're getting there. So nice. Yeah. So that's my something nice building sled runs and getting the kids to go really fast. Awesome. We'll that particular setup sounds like a parent's worst nightmare. <laughs> And here I am, kids, go down it more. I need you to test it. Yep. <laughs> Shoot yourself out into the back lane. <laughs> we'll My parents spotters. were the same way. I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait to come over and take a look at it. I won't take hey, a sled down. Hey, you can ride it. Because, no. You can. Well, no, I can. I would never get up again, but I could. <laughs> My something nice is having had two weeks off to spend time with Laura and the kids. I was I was sick for for some of it, which is not ideal, but but it was still nice to to have the time and and like that. So back back at it tomorrow. I as a runner up, I will note something that listeners might want to check out. As loath as I am to recommend competitors to this year' podcast, if anyone out there is interested in critical coverage of the tech industry. Allow me to recommend the podcast Tech Won't Save Us, hosted by Canada's own Paris Marx. Ah, oh, I will have to check that one out. Sounds just as misanthropic as I am. <laughs> Ashwin, you got anything yet? Sure. I would like to say that my something nice is that thanks to the incredible generosity and wonderfulness of all of the people who love me, I think I'm going to get a kiln again. Yay! I like decided on a whim to do no prep and just launch a bake sale and I sold a lot of cookies and made a lot of cookies and Lauren did a lot of dishes <laughs> and people want me to have a kiln and it's really exciting. Ooh. That's great news. 
that's also part of my something nice is honestly i mean it, it, again it sounds like a backwards something nice but i'm glad that a new year is starting and we can put 2022 behind us without going into too much detail it was not a great year but we've got things like ashlyn getting a new kiln and i'm looking forward to starting again so i'm trying to go into the year cautiously optimistic Mm -hmm. well that's that's good (laughs) Mm -hmm. i mean it's not a huge something nice but it's something we're something hopeful we'll call it something hopeful sure well thanks for joining me tonight folks what are we talking about about next month (laughs) good question (laughs) <laughs> I'm still fully on board for Cricket Cast. <laughs> cricket Cast? All about crickets? Yeah. When we Everyone put in the crickets, talking about Cricket Cast. We put in the cricket sound effect from last month when Laura, we asked Laura, what are we talking about next month? Oh. <laughs> and then we're like, maybe we should actually just talk about crickets. Uh, they are pretty weird. Mm-hmm. We could, we could talk about crickets. I don't know. We'll figure something out. Yeah. Yep. yep. TBD. Maybe we should stop having this segment at the end of the show. Yeah. <laughs> it is funny, though. Yeah, yeah every fair. time. <laughs> Listeners, why don't you tell us what to talk about? There we go. What if we don't like their ideas, though, and then we feel bad? Well, we never promised to use them. We just <laughs> wanted the ideas. <laughs> anyway, we'll talk about it next month. Woohoo! Good night. <laughs> Good night, night everybody. <laughs> Good Happy night. New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We should have predicted something nice. (laughs) (laughs) Show notes and references for all of our episodes are available at lueepodcast.com, where you can also find links to donate or get in touch. If you'd like to support the show, the best way to do that is with a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you found us, or by sharing this episode with a friend. (laughs) 